All right, when you're walking, should you be landing on your heel? Should you be rolling over your heel? Should you be landing flat-footed? Should you be landing on your forefoot? Should you be landing on your toes? Should you be floating in the air and never touching the ground? Uh, I don't know. Let's take a look and find out on today's episode of The Movement Movement, the podcast for people who want to know the truth about what it takes to have a happy, healthy, strong body starting feet first. This thing's at the end of your legs. And we're going to break down the propaganda and the mythology and sometimes the flat-out lies people have been telling you about what it takes to run or walk or hike or do yoga or CrossFit or play in whatever way you like to do that. And they do that enjoyably and effectively and efficiently. And did I say enjoyably? Trick question. I know I did because look, it's the most important thing. If you're not having a good time, do something different so you are because you won't keep it up if you don't enjoy it or unless you're a glutton for punishment. And where's the fun of that? <laughs> unless you're a glutton for punishment. And then I guess that's fun. Anyway, be that as it may, I'm Stephen Sashin, co-CEO, co-founder of ZeroShoes.com. Here's the t-shirt to prove it. And also ZeroShoes.eu and ZeroShoes.co.uk, basically Zero Shoes. And this is the Movement Movement podcast because we, and that includes you, more about that in a second, are creating a movement about natural movement, letting your body do what it's made to do, getting out of the way of things that make it worse, even though they're advertised as things that make it better. All you need to do to be part of the movement is spread the word. Go to our website, www.jointhemovementmovement.com. There's nothing you need to do to join. There's no money involved. There's no secret handshake. There's no sing song and dance that we do every day. It's just that's the only domain I could get. So that's the one we're using. And you'll find the previous episodes of the podcast, all the ways you can interact with us, and the places you can leave a review and a thumbs up and a five star or something and the bell icon on YouTube. And look at the drill. If you want to be part of the tribe, just subscribe. All right, here we go. Sperry, do me a favor. Tell people who you are and what the hell you do, and then we'll talk about why you're here. So my name is Barry Weinstein. I am the head coach at Foot Camp, which is New York's premier barefoot walking studio. I have a class in Central Park, New York, where I get New Yorkers to take off their shoes, which they do not like to do. And I guide them through a course where we walk on hard surfaces, rocks and gravel and grass, and try to create an introduction to your feet. So I must ask the obvious, partially obnoxious sounding question. If you are New York's premier barefoot studio, is there any competition whatsoever? Nope. <laughs> nope. I'm the only one. I think there's something like 8 million people in the city and I'm the only one doing this. So I get the label of premier right off the bat. New York's number one undefeated top of the line barefoot Fastest studio. Fastest growing <laughs> as well. So... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So as someone who lived in New York for 10 years, from 83 to 93, and when I go back, I'm either walking around often in our sandals or in bare feet, much to the chagrin of many people. I can't wait to hear about that part. Do you want to say more about how you got to uh, this before we jump into the question that I teased everybody with about walking form and structure, et cetera? Sure, sure. So I ran the New York City Marathon in 2022 uh, with shoes, ultra shoes, so with the cushion and foot-shaped toe box had a cushion, uh, zero drop design, so almost there, but not there. And I got a back injury from heel striking. And this was running, so we're not talking about walking, we're talking about running. Yeah. Well, so pause there. How did you conclude, and I'm not arguing, of course, but yeah. how did you conclude that heel striking was the cause of whatever happened to your back? Oh, I read Born to Run like the rest of us. Read Born to Run. Everyone's saying read to Born to Run. I said, ah, Born to Run. It's a bunch of hippie stuff, right? I don't want to I don't want to hear that. I read Born to Run changes my life. And I realized that my injuries, because when you're in New York, you have your shoes on all the time. I grew up in a shoes on in the house household. I had deformities in my feet, just like everyone else in the Western world, bunion, plantar fasciitis. I had a Taylor's bunion on my pinky. I had a very severe foot weakness and I was jumping from shoe to shoe, a Nike Pegasus. I eventually settled once all the foam ran out on Hoka shoes with the big thick cushion. And I said, if only they made a shoe with even more cushion. Uh, because I ran out of cushion on that. And I ended up running the Brooklyn Half Marathon and heel striking through it. And I got severe back pain. And I said, how could I have severe back pain? And it's like I'm running on clouds. It's like I'm running on zero gravity. And that's when I read Born to Run. And then I saw in Harvard University went to, I think, Eldoret, Kenya, and started looking at the college kids running and said, they don't run like we do. They uh, have fascia strength, they have foot strength, they're running on the ball of their foot. And I said, well, that's curious. They're running on the ball of their foot. 
And the other thing is I'm so what I'm actually good at, I'm 225 pounds. I'm not a good runner, but I'm actually good at is a hammer throw and uh, Olympic weightlifting and the hammer deal in the uh, snatch in the Olympic weightlifting are the two most technically demanding movements in sport. And that's one and two with hammer being first snatch being second. I have a very good knowledge of technique in general, which made me question the fact why I didn't know how to walk or run. So I, I'm in the 2022 New York City Marathon. I'm getting ready for the photo station. They let you know so you can strike a pose. And you know what pose I struck? A massive raging heel strike. Just like that. I was probably 600 meters from the finish of the marathon. I'm looking at it later after reading Born to Run, and I find out that heel striking is not good for us, and it causes back pain, ankle uh pain, headaches, everything that I've been experiencing my entire life of 22 years in the sport. I used to work for the New York Roadrunners who puts on the New York City Marathon. So I have 22 years in the sport. It was the first time I had ever heard it. I had spoken to thousands, hundreds of thousands of runners, even elite runners. I had gone through coaching with Olympians at the Armory in high school. I had an Olympian coach us and never once did they tell me I should cure my heel strike. And I reborn to run. I look at this. All of a sudden, I say to myself, wow, the running shoes that, that we're being given are causing our injuries. And I've spent so much money on these. And so I said, OK. And I still haven't come to the conclusion of this experiment. But I said, before I start telling everyone else this, I need to ditch the shoes. And I need to see, because if, if I end up in severe crippling pain for the rest of my life, and at least it's just me, um, but I have to do an experiment where I start off in the zero shoes. I start off in zero shoes, the zero Prios, which I still wear today. I have a couple of them. And those are the popular ones too. And then those are the ones I, I've experienced with. I, I'm running in the zero shoes up to my local Costco to get some smoked salmon or something. And I heel strike the way through it. And the next day, I go, oh, my back hurts like absolute crazy. But there was something different about it this time. Because now I knew. Now I knew. I said, whoa, don't heel strike in minimalist shoes. And then I go online. I find runforefoot.com with Bretta Richards, Bretta Riches, who's a Canadian running form practitioner who focuses on forefoot running. And she has, and I see this woman running without shoes over rugged terrain, something that before that, I thought was impossible to do. I said the human foot was not even designed for this. You'll get stress fractures, you'll get all sorts of things. And I see this woman doing it. And here's the other thing. She's not wincing. She's enjoying it, which is incredible. And this isn't even the minimalist earth runner type sandals. This is like straight up unshod, straight up not even first world type thing. This is outside the Western industrialized world kind of no shoes. It was incredible, but it was mostly incredible because she's in Canada. And I'd only seen people ever do this in documentaries in plains of Africa and all these places where they win all the championships. And she says that the difference between the four foot running and the heel strike running is that you get to use your Achilles tendon when you run on your four foot, which has 850 pounds of force absorption capacity, much more than the squishy shoes, even the new Nova Blasts with all of this. And you don't need the stiff soled running shoes. They're actually hurting you. I go for a run the first time in the zero shoes. I'm sorry, the second time after I learned no heel strike, I made it to the other side of Central Park. I can't run another step. That was it. It was probably something like 400 meters. Now I'm stuck on the west side and I can't take another step home. So I have to decide whether or not I'm going to go on the horse carriage or the pedicab, both which cost a week's salary. But I end up just walking on my heels back home. Do it again. Make it around the whole loop after probably three, four weeks of this, but each time getting totally stranded at a different part of Manhattan trying to work my way home. But then I start to see improvement in my feet, but most importantly, improvement in my low back, which I had eight months of chronic back pain from my running, which no one should ever have this sort of back pain from running is good for you. Running is something that should help you. And I eventually saw that my, my feet were the only things that were getting work, the only things that were improving. The rest of my body actually stopped having the orthopedic pain. 
eventually I ran nine miles down to my wife in the zero shoes. Now I'm 225 pounds. Nine miles to me is equivalent to you, 30, 40 miles. <laughs> you, you misunderstood. If I have to go 30 or 40 miles, I'm doing that in a car. Yeah. Uh, oh. Sprinter, I don't even take turns at the end of the track. That's too, because first of all, I don't have a GPS watch. I don't like getting lost. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand distance at all. It's very confusing to me. What's so funny about it is you, so everyone says the same things to me and you being, you having lived in New York, that in New York City and probably London as well, where I live, there's a modesty culture behind shoes. It's, it's almost, and you say, what do I mean by modesty culture? When you go to some parts of the world and you're not supposed to not cover your head, it's the same in New York City. And I've had people have public freakouts where I'm in the park. And, and when I'm in the park running barefoot, I'm headphones in hood up, stop talking to me, everyone. I got to get my workout in. But you obviously want to spread the word. But every time within two or three minutes, you're running, someone's going up to you saying, earphones out. I need to ask you questions about what you're doing. And they've never seen it before. I had never seen it before. And I've been on this experiment where now I am a fairly comfortable long distance barefoot runner. And I can run on rocks on the bridle path, which is all rocky and sandy. I can do that for, for long distances. I run on asphalt. People say, oh, aren't you afraid of the impact of asphalt? And they just don't understand. The impact is absorbed and recycled by your Achilles tendon when you just get out of the stiff sole shoes and get up into that forefoot position. It's like a bow and arrow. And it goes boing like that. And it protects your orthopedic system from shock. And they all are so confused about what is healthy for you because when you show them the Hoka shoes with the narrow toe box and the, the two inches of foam, they all say, I want that one because that's going to protect me. But that is why we have 80% rates of injury to our back and feet. But in the Western world, when people in the non-industrialized world who grow up barefoot can still use squat toilets into their 90s, and can still run long distances into their 90s. So it's we're losing this battle, Stephen, but we got to keep fighting. But everyone outside, the foam's getting worse, the heels are getting worse, and the solution that people have is now new niche uh, shoe companies with even more foam, and they're rolling ankles and all that. Oh, it's even crazier. There's an event every year called the Running Event. It's for companies that are selling to running shoe stores. And not only have things gotten higher, but they're now making what I'm referring to as single-use shoes because that's what they are. They basically oh. have gotten rid of the outsole, the rubber outsole. They're basically just using the midsole foam. And the idea is that you'll wear these for one race and then they'll be useless. And guess how much they cost? $500, the Adidas ones. 400 to 500. And, 400 to 500. Yeah. And the now the interesting thing is I can make an argument for why they may make you faster. And the argument is simply that they're so light that there's less energy just moving your legs. They're not slowing down your steps per minute, slowing down your cadence. And because they're so high, they're basically allowing your stride length to be slightly longer because of the height. And you, if you have your stride frequency staying the same and your stride length getting slightly longer, that makes you technically faster. And But it's a fake out. It's, it's a fake way of doing it. And, but I was blown away by seeing even like new startup companies going for even higher, even thicker, even whatever else it was. Now that said, I also think that when we're the only game in town in a place like that event, then things are going to turn and they are starting to turn in a number of ways. So while we haven't, we're, I don't know that we're losing the battle, but we're definitely gaining some ground in the battle. Just we haven't taken over the opponent's we haven't made it across their fic fictional border yet. Okay. Yes. That's the, that's the I can way. see that. So I went for a run on the bridal path and I ran into a guy who was a financial guy of some sort of financial genius. And he stopped me on his way to work and he stopped his commute and said, what are you doing? And I was like, don't you need to be somewhere instead of asking me these questions? But he got me in contact with the BBC, who was not even on. He, he just said, let me call this financial guy at the BBC and get you on television because we need people to see this. 
And I spoke to the BBC about this with a guy who read Born to Run and still wears super cushioned ultra shoes and yeah. still that that's the weirdest one because um, you get people who read it and then they do the opposite from having read it. I have been in a number of orthopedic offices in my day in the last 14 years. And the number of times where they have a number of books in the office is very high. And the number of times Born to Run is one of those books is almost 100%. And then everybody walks in wearing their, quote, normal shoes. And they, and they all talk about how they love the book. It's like, but you didn't get it. It's because the, the, the group dynamic, especially in Absolutely. urban centers, is crazy Absolutely. and they in terms of the claims not now there's the claims i've seen the 500 i've seen the 450 dollar single use super shoe if you put that on a mid-level athlete because this is supposed to make you faster and the alpha flies for the the slow group unacceptable carbon plate for the slow group unacceptable Cold spring, the roll off technology, yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. And you know what I do all day? So, the, for my marketing, I don't have any paid at anything. I just go on Facebook, I Google foot pain from running shoes. I then look at everyone who made their comments uh, from foot pain from running shoes. And then I just say, just repeat points from born to run over and over. And eventually you, get into their head but it's one person at a time and then in some ways like i don't recommend ultra shoes because ultra right. shoes have other problems which is the cushion makes us stomp our feet and cuts off our two hundred thousand nerve endings at the bottom of our foot which are there to guide us to learn how to run but they're like harm reduction because the people i talk to have bunion and they have all of this and then they have the heel and they have all the technology and they're just getting clunkier and clunkier shoes and they need something and when you see these technologies especially on christmas time people get gifted shoes and then they'll go on the forums and say does anyone have experience with these shoes should i return them or should i keep them so they don't have any love for these shoes yet but that's where you need to be like, return those shoes, get those back into the thing. And I've got a book recommendation for you. Uh, first of all, kudos to you for engaging in the conversation. The And you're right. The biggest thing that impacts people is what they think other people are doing and what they what those people in their social circle or circles would think if they did something outside of the norm. There's a book called How Minds Change by a guy named Dave McRaney. And if you're going to be dealing one on one with people, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of the book. The first thing you need to do is basically build rapport with people by helping them realize that you're more than willing to hear their story and hear what they believe without criticism, without questions, like literally bring letting them tell you more and more about their experience. There are not, by the way, there are like four people who develop variations on this technique. The second part is getting them to, and this is what leads to all the rest of it, is getting them to think about their thinking in a way that they haven't done before. And one of the ways that almost everyone has come up with is you ask them something like, let's say we're talking about art support and they've been talking about how they need art support and they're trying all these different products, et cetera. You can say on a scale of one to a hundred, uh, how confident are you that art support is the solution? And if they say anything other than a hundred, the question is, why not 100? Why isn't it higher? Or what would it take to be a little lower? And or where were you before you even heard of the concept of art support? If you can remember back that far, which pretty much means you were in the womb. So, yeah. <laughs> so once they explain something about why they're not 100% confident, and it may be something as simple as I've tried a bunch of things and they don't seem to work. Then that opens up another conversation where you can start to get them to think about their thinking, how they come to conclusions, where they get information. The first person who recommended our support, tell me about that. And what made you decide to believe that person versus something else? And anyway, it gets very interesting. And then you ask them again at, at certain points, where is your confidence level? And sometimes with some of these conversations, you can get people from one side of the fence I, I'm 99.9% I'm .9 to I'm 0.1%. And sometimes all you're doing is getting people 
to be a little curious. And yes. If somebody becomes a little curious, that's not a hundred percent, but it's often good enough because that wasn't there before. And then maybe they're going to look at something anyway. Now the trick for me is that I can't do, I don't have the time to do just one-on-one -on -one all day, every day, 24 seven. And so I'm actually talking to the people who develop these various techniques. And by the way, they have all given up on the idea of trying to change someone's mind. Actually th one out of the four is undeniably there to get people from one side of the fence to the other. The other three, they are there to just have the conversation wherever it goes. And they've dropped all intention of having someone change their mind, either in real time or at all, which is admirable. I'm trying to change people's minds. I'm literally talking to the four people in the book. I've already talked to one and the guy who wrote the book um, to have a conversation about this. But anyway, be that as it may. So that's my kudos to you for doing that. I, I, want, I want to, and I think you might find the book interesting because it might make some of those conversations more interesting, which brings me to a question I wanted to ask when you are, oh, two things. It's not just major metropolitan areas where if you are in bare feet, people are going, what the hell's going on here? Here I am in the middle of Colorado. I spend a lot of time in bare feet and I get it all the time. It, it's a weird thing that when I'm e either in bare feet or what I'm wearing now, which is shoes two different colors of the same style. You do anything unusual with your footwear and people notice it from 50 yards away and they've got opinions. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite barefoot one, and I'm going to come back to you for the win in a minute, is when it's in the summer and I'm like going to Costco, into Costco, and I do go into Costco and into our grocery store and into our favorite restaurants. They all know me by now. In fact, at Costco, I, I'm sure I've told the story I was in the line at the pharmacy and the guy behind me says, hey, your shoes don't match. And the pharmacist, without even looking up, says, he's wearing shoes today. So <laughs> they, they know who I am. But I'm walking in once and a little kid, five years old, says, mommy, that man's not wearing shoes. And the mom, to her credit, said, why don't you ask him about that? And he says, how come you're not wearing shoes? I said, have you ever been to the beach? He says, yeah. I said, do you wear shoes on the beach? He goes, no. I said, how's that feel? He goes, oh, it's really fun. I go, same thing even when you're not at the beach. He's, oh, and mom was like, okay, got to go. So, yeah. <laughs> it, it, there's ways of engaging in a way that are interesting. So I am curious when you are out and about, what is either the most entertaining or craziest thing anyone's ever said to you? I had a woman who was wearing probably three inch heels, which were not anatomical run which was very impressive that's the first thing it was a very impressive run over to me and melt down in front of me saying bare feet there's glass out there be very careful oh. and then she started to hyperventilate and then she ran away from me it was insane it was totally nuts i have people so when when i'm in new york and I'm on the bridal path walking with my wife. So just doing some barefoot walking and keep in mind, I don't really do this as a cultural thing. I don't really do this as a spiritualistic thing. I do this as a sports performance and medical rehabilitation thing. So I don't really, if I could snap my fingers and then cover my feet up with an invisible blanket, I would just to be like everyone else, but I can't do that because I'm not going to put my health at risk by uh, doing that. But Everyone within a 400 meter radius is looking at me. Nobody's looking away. I'm in Central Park. They're worried about me. They're disgusted by me. They think oh, I'm wait, a total wait, I'm gonna pause. freak. Wait, I'm going to pause. They're worried about you. This is the antithetical to what people think about New Yorkers. Granted, they're misguided, but they're concerned for you. They worry. New Yorkers are so compassionate. They just may be a little off base. They're a little off base. And the history is interesting too, because- when people from England came to the American South, they came from the north of England. And this was less rich at the time, or might have yeah, I think it was a little bit less rich than the south of England, where all the queen is and all the hoity toity people are. And, um, and then they came to New York. By, by, by the way, the queen is not there any longer. Unfortunately well, not. This queen was Queen Victoria or Queen Elizabeth, so she's not there either yeah. anymore. Rest in peace to uh, all due respect to the queen. But the, the history behind the foot uh, with the horses 
The, the history behind the rounds of toe box was to fit into our horse stirrups. Okay. The point of toe box, the hit, and I was equestrian as well. You do need a, you do need a, a shoe to it fit helps. your, it helps. And then the heel, unless you're riding bareback, which Native Americans used to do, which is incredible. And probably you can't say much on that, but then the heel as well. And this is a cultural thing that was heavily, heavily concentrated in the South of England because Elizabethan England, you started getting uh, widespread access to horses. And just if you're in your car, people are more willing to talk to you because they say, oh, he, he's a car owner. He, he must be in the community or something. I've noticed that since getting a car a couple of years ago in Manhattan. I've never even done that in my life. But it was the same thing. Having a horse meant you were a person of respect. And those people who had the horses came to New York. The people who did not yet have access to the horses came to the American South. And I find that in places in the American South, Northerners will make fun of certain communities in the American South that have acceptance for unshod lifestyle, barefoot lifestyle, laugh at them. I've seen this multiple times, but the problem is that the shoes that people wear in the North are quite literally causing them all sorts of yeah. damage. And it's the other thing is, why do you think a lot of sprinters with good fashion strength are coming from Florida, Beach Town, and Texas, which is slightly more welcoming to, to people with bare feet? And Australia, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jamaica, yeah, unshod culture. You can be a classy person in Australia, in, in Jamaica. I keep saying Australia, but they're the same thing. They're the other place with a really big barefoot culture and good track and field teams. And we can't even keep up with East Africa in the marathon and people say, oh, it's there in the mountains. But then there's people in Colorado in the mountains who can't keep up. And then, but, but the reason why is because they run barefoot in cross country up until sub elite. And then when they get into the elites, they put $500 single use shoes on them and they only have to use it once and they get their payout. But if these shoes really did make you faster, you would find the people using them getting faster. But people get faster when they run barefoot and, and when they go finally their elite level or sub elite level in Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and even Faith Kipiegon, I think, came in a bronze medal place in the World Cross Country Championships barefoot. That was a modern version of this. And it's it's really bad because the culture here in New York is so damaging and people start to age here at age 30 in the same way that people in who survive until that age in rural China age at 90. Mm. And it's, and they, they say it must be genetics. It must be genetics, those people out there. But the second those people move to the United States and have kids, their kids put on the shoes and then they start to have the same wear profiles as we have in the, in the New York area. So the question is, this is all one big long rant going back to do the $500 shoes make you faster if we were to do a real estimate of that, we have to look at everybody who wears the super shoes. Right. I would say 60% of them within a couple of weeks will be going zero miles an hour because <laughs> they'll get injured from it because super shoes get you super injured. And then the other 40% will probably see a slight, you know, while, while they can last outside of being injured, they'll see maybe a slight advantage from some spring. And then eventually as they lose the ability to use their Achilles tendon, they'll get injured in the next year. And then the one guy who is already running two hours, nine minutes marathon barefoot or whatever is going to get the shoes, get his shoe sponsorship. And then his kids are going to go into shoes and then never, that's why heredity doesn't seem to be such a big thing in, in the sport of track and field, because in the marathon, you get rich, you put your kids in shoes and then the, the kids no longer become competitive. It's not the shoes that do it. It's the people that do it. The shoes are fashion. It's funny. Elliot Kipchoge, who broke the sub to our marathon under perfect conditions, there was an article that, that came, a couple articles that came out that kind of got squashed where the headline was him saying, it wasn't the shoes, it was my legs. But nobody appreciated that. Now, I'm not going to argue that certain shoes may, for certain people, help a little compared to what they were wearing before, but there are other confounding factors, placebo effect being one, and many things where you want to put this, where if you, well, it's basically placebo. If you think these things are going to be helpful, the signals that you used to get that were telling you slow down or signals that you're now using saying speed up or stay consistent or whatever it is, there are, of course, people who are still winning races who aren't in their shoes. The reason that everyone's wearing those shoes is not necessarily because they're making people faster, but if 
you're neck and neck with somebody in a lot of races, and then they switch shoes and for whatever reason beat you, the first thing you're going to do the next day is go buy those shoes because yes, people are at the, at the very least superstitious about what it's going to take to beat that guy who's just next to you. There's a friend of mine who, and to your point, I have a friend who is a multi-time Olympian and world champion and race champion, Boston Marathon, New York Marathon, who was trained by Arthur Lydiard in New Zealand. And Lydiard made shoes for his athletes that looked a lot like ours. And she says to me, we never got injured until we got shoe contracts and we're wearing yep. shoes. Never had a problem until then, which was very interesting. And now she lives in her shoes, which is fun. She wears them all the time. She doesn't actually live in them. She's much taller than it would take <laughs> to actually live in a pair, let alone a number. <laughs> there was one other point that I wanted to make, seeing if I can remember it. Oh, the other thing about runners and sprinters in particular is when there is a cultural pressure or cultural support, is it, which is goes hand in hand to that supporting this, this event, marathon, sprints, whatever, then there's going to be more people doing it. And you are going to just find, if you have a bigger pool of people, you're going to find those weird genetic freaks who weren't going to do it before, but now there's some cultural benefit for doing it and they're going to show up as well. So there's some advantage of just having more people doing it. To sprinting, I will say one of the things, and th this could get me uh, canceled. So here we go. I I've joked with a friend of mine who's a world champion four by 400 meter runner and 400 American champion, 400 meter runner, who has been a coach of mine as well as being a friend who is a tall, really un, just unpleasantly good looking guy. He's just one of these guys. Actually, it's funny when he's got his game face on, when he's ready to compete, he's just scary. I didn't talk to this guy for years because he scared the crap out of me. Yeah. When he's, when he's done and he smiles, this guy's model gorgeous. Just yeah. Like, spectacularly good looking. Anyway, I joked with him. I said, it's not, how do I want to put this? It's well known in the sprinting community that having uh, good strength in your glutes and hamstrings is really important, especially. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the way most white people walk, they don't use their glutes. And if you watch nope. the way most black people walk, and again, this is going to get me canceled, ignore it is they're walking in a way that's actually using their glutes. And I've exaggerated this kind of stereotypical way that black guys walk. And he just burst in hysterics. I said, do you think this is why there's only been one white guy who only one time ever ran a sub 10 second, hundred meters? And actually- Oh, there's, there's only one. There's actually two, but the second one, it was uh, wind aided. So there's only one who's ever done it without wind aided. And he only did it one time. And I said, so do you think this is the reason why no white guys run a sub 10? And he just burst <laughs> in hysterics. He goes, could be, don't know. That's really interesting. It's glute recruitment. Once again, we have a time. Jamaica is a huge landmass, but it's a tiny island nation, a, a tiny island nation in population. And they produce all the best women sprinters. Now, of course, there's Shakari's our shining hope, but <laughs> Elaine Thompson. And then also Shawnee Miller Uibo. I think she was from the Bahamas. But the thing is, is this region. Same idea. The Bahamas, St. Kitts, which I mean, yeah, it's all, that whole area. Yeah barefoot culture. It's okay to walk outside barefoot. No one's going to be staring at you, Steve. And if you're on in anywhere in Jamaica barefoot. To that point, there is a specific correlation between foot and ankle strength and sprinting speed. There's a, do you know the RSI test? No, I've heard it in the past. Okay, I'm not smart about fun. it. Basically, you put your hands on your hips and you bounce up and down 10 times as high as mm -hmm. you can while trying to bend your hips and your knees as little as possible. You're just bouncing with your feet and ankles. And what you measure is the, what you do is you divide the amount of time you're in the air by the amount of time you're on the ground. And basically anything over 2.5 is really good. Over 2.7 is like exceptionally good. Over three, you are a freak. I am happy to pat myself on the back and say at the age of 61, I'm like a 2.71 and I'm a pretty good sprinter. So foot strength, hugely important. Research is very clear. Walking around barefoot, or the research was actually in minimal shoes, builds foot strength as much as doing an exercise program. And the other thing, is there's all, there is a, let's call it for lack of a better term, an epigenetic version of this, where people who start out as dance, ballet dancers in particular, or gymnasts, or jump ropers, or anything where yep. as a young person, you're doing a lot of foot strengthening things, which goes back to the point you're making about people growing up in a barefoot cu culture. That helps really a, a lot too. I started out as a diver, became an all-American gymnast. So, you know, but 
there's also there is the genetic component to that because some people can build that foot strength, but they're just not fast for whatever other reasons. My it turns out my grandfather, I didn't know this till I was in my mid forties, nor did my mother ever. My grandfather was a gymnast. And oh wow. Who knew? So who you know, knew? Maybe there's something in there. Don't know. So the so Valerie Allman, the discus thrower. So I'm yeah. New York discus thrower champion. So I'm a discus thrower and that's not even the master's division, but I had to beat a couple of college kids, but New York, there's no Wait. throwers because we're all not really thrower types. So it's an easy field, but we, uh, Valerie Allman was a dancer and she would go on point in like in ballet. And then she's the discus throw champ. She throws farther than I do. She, she throws the men's weight probably twice as far as I do. It's oh, I incredible. It. But so dancing definitely and volleyball as well, anything with a large oh, yeah. forefoot, but you notice that in the vault in gymnastics for women, you do have a barefoot run up oh, to yeah. the vault. And people always say, why do gymnasts run so weird? Actually, they're the only ones in Western society who can run right. The rest of us are all... <laughs> well, no, no. Have... Admittedly, they run weird. Not all of them, because many of them, yeah, do that straight arm mechanical robot thing. I don't know why. It really doesn't. <laughs> Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Actually, I can t now that I never thought about it till right now. I can think of why. Because when you watch what they're doing with their arms, they're basically keeping their arm swing to a minimum, which helps pick up cadence. Because you only have a limited amount of time to run. And and I knew for me, I knew what my maximum when I hit my maximum speed, which was not running the entire length of the runway. It was about ten feet less because I just figured yeah. out the max speed want to hit the board that way. But yeah, they do have mostly weird arm swing because they haven't been taught to actually run in a way where they could look normal-ish. But they're also, right. there's, there's another reason as well, which is that for some of those vaults, you need to get your arms from behind you to in front of you straight quickly. And it may be advantageous to do it that way because you don't see oh, them. That's so interesting. But yeah, because when you look on Florex, where they have to run as well, many of them don't have that weird arm thing when they're running before a round off, but their last step or toe for a round off do look weird because they figured out a weird technique to get them in the, <laughs> position in the right way. But that's neither here nor there. Gymnastics that's, is so complicated. Gymnastics, I'll tell you about gymnastics. Now the floor, when you're doing floor exercise, is basically a trampoline. And I used to watch the Olympics and when I was doing this with my girlfriend and I was getting like really frustrated and she goes, what are you just jealous? I went, yeah, because the moves that they just did, I was doing in high school, but I was doing them on a wrestling mat. And they, if they had done that move that way on a wrestling mat, they would have just broken both of their ankles. So I'm jealous because I never got the opportunity to do shit on a trampoline like floor where I would have been able to do some crazy stuff that no wow. one had. Oh. Mother of all sports, I think it's so impressive. I'm an Olympic weightlifter as well. They're all ex-gymnasts. I think that the emphasis on technique, we need to borrow from gymnastics into running. Because oh. when you... Don't get me... I'm just going to say it this way. There are things that you do as a gymnast to learn highly complicated movements that have never been applied to, I'm going to say sprinting in particular. And I have figured out a way to do that. There's actually... Two, and then there's a third thing that has nothing to do with gym, gymnastics that needs to be done. And I'm actually working with some guys on a patent that I have about how to do this because many people think sprinting is just faster running. And if they have bad running form, they just need to move their legs faster, which is not the case. There's It's learning how to sprint. And I would argue that I'm still, yikes, still, make that go away, my apologies. I'm still learning how to do that. To learn how to sprint, you're either lucky enough to figure it out somehow, or it's just built into the way you naturally move. But I believe that I could take a, let's say, mid-level sprinter and mm -hmm. make them a highly competitive sprinter by using some things from gymnastics to teach them the proper form and embed that in their brain in a way that becomes the way that my undergraduate research at Duke was on cognitive aspects of motor skill acquisition. I know what it takes to learn a new movement pattern. There's no opportunity to do those things in track and field act activities. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. For me, my, my philosophy, how I learned my running technique, I obviously had all the drills, A skip, B skip, C skip, all that stuff. Many years, my running te technique wasn't getting any better, still heel striking. For me, I found that the best thing to get an efficient running technique is the nervous system in the foot. 
and a combination of your natural environment as well as the 200,000 nerve endings of the foot. If you're coming down on your heel too much, ouch. If you're running too high up on here, ouch. And then eventually you find how to do it. If you land too far forward to your big toe, ouch. So eventually you have to run gingerly on the outside of your foot. And after a million steps, a million renditions, each one of them just hurting like nuts. (laughs) And there's nothing you can do about it. You have to choose this pain or you have to choose orthopedic pain that will just happen to you. So you, you are, you're the perfect case for this. My wife has a great line. She says, our shoes aren't doing anything other than becoming your coach. The feedback that you're going to get, if you listen to it, will coach you into better form. Optimal form, not necessarily. I've seen people who have the idea you're supposed to land on the ball of your foot, and we're about to get there, do crazy things like reach way out in front of them with their foot and point their toe to land on their foot. I know it's horrible. I've seen people learn to run by basically uh, doing a fast version of how Groucho Marx walks. So there, again, it's not actually running form. So there are ways if you're getting the wrong feedback or not knowing how to interpret the feedback where you can still be a little out of whack. I have another patent for that, working on that problem. But anyway, let's move on to the thing that we tease this with, because this is the perfect segue. And that is this whole question of how you're supposed to, where you're supposed to land on your foot. When you mm-hmm. up. most people, we talked about running, but you brought it up about walking and you have told me taken what many would consider a controversial position about this. So yes. let the controversy begin. Okay. In the West, we started wearing heeled shoes. I, I know you know this was just for the audience who needs to hear the whole story. We started wearing heeled shoes and narrow toe boxes from a tradition of equestrian transportation, so horses, where the narrow toe box shoes goes in the stirrup and the heel prevents you from slipping out of the stirrup. The okay. two inch or one inch heel on the back of the shoe interrupted our natural walking gait where you land on the forefoot and then go down, come down to the midfoot and just like a bow and arrow, and then you push off. So what this happened was that this interfered with this block here and we started going for dunk. So let, and me then, pause there. Yes. so let me pause because the controversy is in the one w- or the phrase that you used about it being our natural thing to where yes. we land ball of the foot. So yes. where, pray tell, I figure if we're going to talk about equestrians from the 1800s, I can say pray tell. Where, pray tell, did you, and I'm not saying you're right or wrong, where, where, did you, where and how did you come to that conclusion? That's the natural way to walk. In northern Tanzania... The Hadza tribe, who are a modern hunter-gatherer tribe, who walks for business, they're not a nomadic tribe, but they are persistence hunters, the same way of hunting that was in Born to Run, discussed in Born to Run. They are, I think, the last true Bushmen of Africa. There's video of them where they're walking along a rocky path where they are walking on their forefoot, every one of them. And okay. the, so that's the first piece of evidence. Okay. And I'm just going to do a second one. The second one, look at how toddlers and kids walk. Because toddlers walk, they, they need to learn how to come down on their heel a little bit. Because when you're when toddlers and kids will actually run and walk way super Kipchoge heel, nowhere near touching the ground. And do you know what doctors do when the kid doesn't? And the, the other thing will happen, special needs kids, people always talk about, so somehow special needs kids will be four foot walking. Why is that? Because special needs kids aren't attending school at a regular basis the way the non-special needs kids are. They're homeschooled. And oftentimes these kids will not be forced to wear footwear in the house. So because of that, they never get the, the fascia, binding construction of a modern shoe and will continue to four foot walk. They say, oh, it must be something to do with a a mental disability of some sort, but it's not. It's just because they aren't being socialized to wear mandatory footwear. And indigenous people in northern Tanzania, the Hadza tribe or Hadzabi tribe, as well as kids, as well as what happens unhindered. Okay. So the things that I'm going to say are based on ideas that I have about walking form, but I'm going to throw this out there. And again, I'm not taking a position at this moment. Sure. 
you mentioned with the Hatsu tribe watching them walking on rocky surfaces. Yes. My question is, what if anything changes if they're walking on a flat, smooth surface? Sure. Or if they're walking uphill or downhill, and if they're walking at different speeds, and I don't have the answers to yeah. any of these, but I'll tell you, but I'll uh, not surprisingly tell you where I'm going with this. With kids, I'm I'm the first one to say that if you watch kids who grow up predominantly barefoot, what they're doing when they walk and run is different than what they what other kids are doing. The cha- the problem that that I have with using kids is uh, I'm going to take it slightly out of context. It will be not uncommon for someone to show a picture of a baby's foot or someone up to the age of maybe two in their foot where they're where they've got a relatively narrow heel and their toes are spread like crazy wide. And they go, see, that's natural. And I go, yeah, their heads are also three quarters of their body. So <laughs> if you had a baby, sh- if your head as an adult was the size proportionally that it is for a baby, you would be 80% head. We can't use the morphology of prepubescent children or as an example of what we're supposed to be when we become adults. There may be, and I don't know, there may be other factors that lead to how babies and toddlers and special needs kids walk that I, I don't know, I haven't identified. So I, so again, I don't, I'm not going to try and stake a claim in an opposing position, but I want to highlight just a way to think about these things and you, you of just how to investigate the thoughts that we have to start looking for counterfactual information to see if it's valid or not. And so go ahead. Mary Leakey in 1978 went to Northern Tanzania to the Ngorogoro crater, which is truly the cradle of humanity Mm -hmm. and found the oldest trackway. So a trackway is a set of footprints from Australopithecus afarensis, who was the first ever human oh humanoid uh, homo uh, something yes she concluded that this group of early human only used their heels when walking as brakes and (laughs) otherwise and she said when you want to put the brakes on you put the heels down and it's so you, you talk about natural human this they excavated it and i think it's in the british museum right now and you can see that these people are walking in the United States, though they have trackways in White Sands Natural uh, National Park in New Mexico, and they discovered this trackway. They said it was the first human trackway discovered in the U.S. or the North America, and they have a full print. But then they also said that this was a kid, uh, a teenager who was holding a baby downhill. And that it's likely that if you don't put on the brakes, the kid's going forward and holding a big, <laughs> heavy weight. And you can even see that the as the daughter, or, or not the daughter, as the teenage girl puts the baby down, the baby will walk a couple steps and then get tired and start complaining. You have to pick the kid up, put him on the other side, start walking again. So uh, there's, there's plenty of uh, the actual trackways from before we even had any shoes, which suggests a four-foot walk. But the other thing is, is just inside my own body, I, I speak to, and not in my body, I, most of the people I speak to on a daily basis are not running Leadville 100 or doing anything like that. Most of the people have never run in their lives, actually, and they are experiencing the exact same orthopedic problems as people who are just overdoing it, heel strike running, and right. they have never run. So it yeah, can't- it's not about running. It's definitely a simple thing. And we didn't address this specifically. The but you but actually you just gave me the perfect segue for my current thoughts about w- walking and running, and which is when people say where's my foot supposed to land, my answer is you're asking the wrong question, because it's going to vary in some ways based on whether you're walking uphill downhill accelerating decelerating fast or slow and the surface that you're on. I said but my answer is also fundamentally. You want to do the same thing, whether you're walking or running, which is to the point you just made, not overstriding, not reaching out and putting your foot out in front of you, putting the brakes on, getting your foot underneath your center of mass. Now I'll say this and go where, go with it where you will. Here's where I'll, I'm not putting a stake in the ground, but what I notice in my house where the majority of our house is tile, um, we have carpeting in the 
upstairs in our bedroom and in the hallway leading to our bedroom and downstairs in our basement we have we have a room there where there's a little bit of carpet in there too but mostly it's just tile i'll walk in one of two ways i uh, and it depends on if i'm going faster or slower or mm -hmm. it also depends on whether i'm wanting to make sure uh, i don't wake up my wife <laughs> so i will not infrequently be walking landing on the ball of my foot landing like you said before outside edge which is what people refer to as supinating mm -hmm. my foot rolls in Mm -hmm. I'm still landing with my foot mostly underneath my center of mass. If I'm trying mm -hmm. to go faster and I'm still in that same situ situation, I will be overstriding a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes I'm um, still landing in the same way. Or I will land kind of flat footed or sometimes if you, I would need a force plate to really show this. Your heel's a ball and mm -hmm. you can land on different parts of the ball. So if I'm landing where my heel's touching the ground first, still outside edge first, mm -hmm. and mostly towards the front of my foot in that ball mm -hmm. instead of the back of my foot. When I get on the carpeting, I am much more prone to be rolling over that heel. Again, mostly being on the front part of the ball. I'm mm -hmm. much less likely to land forefoot when I'm on the carpeting. Mm -hmm. But again, the key thing from my perspective, which is the same point I make about running, is get your feet underneath you. And push, I just kicked the box behind me. And the thing that moves you forward, and humans have a hard time with this, is the thing that happens to be behind you. Since we don't have eyes behind us, we're not as attentive to the thing that's moving us forward is, if you think about ice skaters, what moves them forward is pushing back, pushing their heel behind them, mm. not letting their foot, the other foot get in front of them, having the foot land underneath them, because if their foot was in front of them, once they took any weight off the back foot, they'd fall on their ass because they yes. just, the foot would go flying out from underneath them. So anyway, that's a roundabout way to say where my current thinking is about walking. So gravity is an oppressive force. Gravity is something gravity that we all, it, gravity is the worst. And no one even knows about it's this. Because the zeros. Yeah. You know, when, when you learn to go barefoot and you actually just say, fine, I have to wake up this morning, actually deal with this gravity thing. You can't keep <laughs> avoiding it. It's bad for me. Um, you start to learn what gravity is the hard way. Yeah. And for humans, the most efficient way to move forward is obviously just to just say, I can't deal with it anymore. And the deadpan fall on your face. <laughs> and so that is I'm not the sure that's most the efficient way. I'm not sure. It's certainly <laughs> the least amount of energy to be to used to get to, it's not moving you forward per se, unless you're trying to cross the finish line. Um, <laughs> yes, the, the least energy you could use, you would just be falling in some direction, most likely forward. Yeah. So uh, if I just give up, I just fall forward on my face, but it also is the most efficient way to move because uh, it doesn't require any muscle. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't require any sort of, you know, it's, it's just a, a natural occurrence. And it's very inexpensive uh, from the amount of oxygen you need and your muscles don't have to work that hard. So walking and running are both simply just continuing this falling on your face right. and catching yourself reflexively. When your back foot is here, people try to think of these muscles. Like in, in weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, it's a lot of muscles. A lot of you, It's a very short movement to, to move the weight over your head, but it's a lot of muscles, it's a lot of oxygen, it's a lot of uh, burning fat, calories, all that stuff. But in running and walking, it's all tendons. And yeah. the, the point of the muscle is the stretch. Same in the throws, especially in the shot put. You want to actually get a stretch reflex where your body thinks your pec is about to break and will reflexively go forward like that. And so when you fall forward on your face in walking and running, all of a sudden your Achilles tendon will load up and then calf muscle is not there to lift you up like all that in your soleus muscle. Your calf muscle is just there to say, oh my goodness, I'm about to rip in half. Let me get this foot out of the way. And it's a stretch reflex. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between running and walking and weightlifting. You're using your muscles in order to move the weight. In running, you're using your muscles just as a stretch reflex and also mm -hmm. throwing as well in track and field. So that's why when you land on your heel, when you're walking, you don't actually activate that stretch reflex right. until you're already on your forefoot. And when well, you do that, your calf muscle, yeah. Again, let's bring that back to, to overstriding because I think there's another piece to this. And 
FYI, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to agree with you and tell you how I've been walking up hills lately. You're going to like it. Uh, yes. So if you overstride and land on your heel, by the time your foot comes down, your plantar fascia are stretched already and unable to be responsive. They're unable to be strong. You basically stretch them without really, well, they're under load, but they're not stretched in a way that is giving your body that signal that you just described of, oh, I have to respond to this. And so then in the same way that if you put too much weight on the bar and you try to lift it when you're in a weak biomechanical position, that's mm -hmm. where you can bicep off the insertion point. Same thing can happen with your plantar fascia is what the hell are you doing with your camera? My apologies. I'm just plugging it in so I don't get it. Yeah, no, that was pretty entertaining though. It was like, Whoa. Oh, okay. <laughs> very roller coastery. So in the same way that again, you could rip your bicep off the off either insertion point, typically distal, if you have too much weight and you're without giving your body the signal through that muscle to be contracting properly, your plantar fascia do the same thing if you overstride and your foot comes down essentially flat. And then arch support, all that's doing is getting your plantar fascia completely out of the way. So you have a weak, non-responsive thing. And now you're banking on upstream parts of your body. I can't think of the word I'm looking for. It's a Friday afternoon that are now having to take, that are having to take the burden of what the information you didn't get from your feet and do things that they're not really wired for. The, the plantar fascia is a uh, genius device with the wind loss mechanism. So the wind loss mechanism, each toe here is a different setting on your foot. So you want it stiff, you're gonna go all the way to your big toe. If you yeah. want it loose, you get it on the outside of your pinky toe. So the most flexible part of your foot is the pinky toe. And then as you get stiffer and are pulling back the bow and arrow by rolling to your big toe, it's stiffening the plantar fascia. The plantar fascia needs to be loose. And just like a piano, how with a piano, the tighter or a guitar, the tighter that string is when you tune it, the higher pitched it becomes. The same thing happens with your plantar fascia. So when you are landing on the outside of the ball of your foot, this is the best place. This is the lowest note. This is so flexible here. And this is the best way to absorb the impact shock from the ground. And the second your heel touches the ground, it's like you're letting off yeah. the tension from the bow and arrow when when you walk and this is the second type of heel strike people don't talk about the heel strike where you land on the ball of your foot and then your heel comes smashing down right. that's a heel strike too so what it is you just want to be have a line from the ball of your foot and and you really need to give a big chest because when you're falling forward you want to fall like this and you want a line from your planner from, from the ball of your foot up to your hips up to here and you literally want to fall on your face and then catch yourself with the other foot. And if your heel doesn't touch the ground, this will create a ball. My foot is like weird now from barefoot running. My foot, your foot's probably weird as well, where we have this backwards bending foot like this and this creates a ball. And what it does is it essentially allows you to simulate a circle. Yeah, go ahead. The biggest thing that it does, the windlass mechanism, what it does is it aligns the bones in your foot into an arch, which is the strongest structure we've ever come up with. And that's the biggest thing that it does. I would contend that, and, and I have some ideas about this and I'm not totally uh, sold on them because I haven't done the research. But for example, we have a bunch of cyclists uh, we used to sponsor a team called the Hincapi team. We're now sponsoring the Nova Nordisk team. The Hincapi guys? I was on the CRCA junior development team. Of course, oh Hincapi God. Sportswear. Yeah, I used to work oh. for Champion Systems. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, so we had one of the Hincapi riders had the Prio, just so happens, in the back of his jersey. They finished their, their training run, a bunch of these riders. They're hanging out at a coffee shop in North Boulder, which, by the way, I always like to say, if you want to make a million dollars fast, just show up with a crane and steal the bike rack at that coffee shop on a Sunday. I know. It's crazy. But anyway, the guy puts on his Prio because he was getting out of his cleats and then rode home just in our shoes and noticed he was putting out more watts in our shoes than when he was clipped in. And mm -hmm. I said, I think it's because when you're wearing cycling shoes, you basically turned your foot into a stupid lever. And the little bit of extra force you're getting from your foot is not necessarily the important thing, but the signal that you're getting when you use your foot that goes upstream into the posterior and interior chain is the thing that is going to be making a difference. You're giving your body, the, I'll say this, you're going to get a kick out of this. 
sprinters in particular, they say your swing leg, the leg that's in the air, you need to dorsiflex. You need to pull your toe up to your knee and you're supposed to keep it dorsiflexed as you land. If you look, there's not one sprinter in the entire history of the fucking world that keeps dorsiflexion through the point when they're coming down to contact the ground. Never. They're not pointing their toes, but they're not pulling it up towards their knee where it's above 90 degrees. Yeah. So not a thing. So I think there's some relationship between that and what happens cycling where there's the right amount of plantar flexion or the right combination, however you want to measure it, where you're engaging things that are sending signals to the other muscles you're using, get ready, about time to fire. That doesn't happen when your foot is a dumb lever in a shoe that doesn't let you move. So the, yeah, the stiff sole, the carbon plates on the, the stiff sole cycling shoes are terrible. I was thinking about this two days ago. I said to myself, there has to be. So I said to myself, nobody knows what we're doing with our footwear. Even in weightlifting, they have these massive two or three inch heels and footwear saying it's going to help us squat better, but it ends up just- well, Hold on, wait, hold, hold, hold that thought. Yes. So the whole thing with Ollie shoes, with shoes with a big heel, for people who don't know, they're basically a wooden plank with a wooden heel underneath them. So you're simulating the ground, but changing the angle. And someone who's an Ollie lifter, and since you are, I'm curious what your thoughts are about this. Those shoes were developed, I'm told, for Ollie lifters, predominantly people, mostly for dealing with a snatch, even more than clean and press, is that, or clean and jerk, it used to be a press, is because <laughs> if you're really, if you really have good form, you're using your shoulders to lock your shoulders out so you're not using, you're basically aligning the bones properly. And if you do yeah. that well, your shoulders are a little hyperextended. Your hands are a little behind your shoulders a little behind your head. Yeah, exactly. And therefore, yeah. when you're especially in snatch, where at that point, because the weight is a little behind you, if you didn't have that little heel lift to tip you forward, you'd be just falling backward. And what's happened is people just assumed, oh, I need those as squat shoes, which is complete bullshit, unless your feet yeah. are just wacky length. It's, it's obviously because Americans want to join Olympic lifting it takes a lifetime to become yeah. a good Olympic lifter. They don't have the ankle mobility. Sponsors, like, let's get these people into the sport. And I, I think it's a version of that guy just wore that shoe and won. I need that shoe for everything. Yeah. yeah. Because it's crazy. Because your trunk angle in the, in the snatch, if you do... So this is the trunk angle with heeled shoes where these tiny muscles on the top of your shoulder this is now supporting the bar when yeah. you get and go down to level you actually have to move forward like that and you get these massive rhomboid and trap muscles supporting the bar and you even saw there was a weightlifter named toshiki yamamoto team japan weightlifter who showed up to an international competition and in weightlifting it's all out national warfare like yeah. serious oh, yeah. stuff and yeah. he shows up to uh international competition when crossfit shoes which were zero drop. And people are like, what is going on like that? And he won. And it's a more yeah. herd mentality. But this herd mentality is so bad for people's low back. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I think that in some ways, I wish we could we start a stampede for minimalist footwear. Like, where's the herd mentality where we're everyone trying. starts wearing zero? I'll tell you something funny. I'll tell you how we're getting there. We're now dealing with a lot of professional. Oh, crap. Uh we just lost Barry, and I think it's because his phone battery died. So I'm going to pause for a sec, and hopefully he'll come back. Okay, thanks to the magic of technology, you're back. All right, where the hell were we? <laughs> so I was asking how we can get zero shoes and minimalist footwear oh. to have the next stampede of people going to switch. So what I was about to say is that very interestingly and appropriately, there are more and more professional athletes getting hip to the idea of the importance of foot strength. And we have a bunch of pro athletes that we've been working with in various sports who are wearing our stuff first, just casually to walk around building foot strength based on the idea that just the research showing that walking in minimalist footwear builds foot strength when mm -hmm. they're training and they're in the gym for reasons that we talked about. And in fact, it reminds me, we have a power lifter. We are at a power lifting event and she came over to our booth and was trying on our shoes and they called her name for the bench. And she's like, I, I got to go. And she just runs over there, comes back a minute later saying, I just set a personal best. And she's, and I felt like I was just gripping the ground and more connected to the ground than ever before. And of course, people who aren't powerlifters typically don't know that even the bench starts with your feet. So, yes. Yeah. So we have all these pro athletes casually training. There are a couple of people who 
in their warmups, either on the court or field, are wearing our shoes. And then when it U.S. comes artistic swimming, is that true? U.S. artistic swimming is a different story, but them as well. USA archery, because the guys there, they say, and the women, they say it's like they feel like they're really more rooted when they're wearing our shoes, which they are. Yes. And But pro-level sports people who are really getting into this. And we are, in fact, I just scheduled a meeting with a guy who's a very big deal football player who said in a conversation we had that wearing our shoes got rid of a whole bunch of issues that he had and it seemingly given him more years in his career. And he's already older than most of the guys that he's playing against. So I think, I hope that's one of the two things that's going on in 2024. I can't even talk about the first one, unfortunately, until we sign the paperwork in a couple of weeks that will help the kind of top down version of that, where there's going to be more people with high status saying, these things change my life. You got to wear these things. But what's going to, the, the key thing that is going to make this work is, we alluded to before, is the people in these smaller communities, there's actually research about this. It's very cool. There's a book called Change by a guy named Damon Santola. And he says, in a small community, when something new gets adopted, it's when 25% of the people adopt it. It's yes. like a magic number. And so some of the top-down stuff will then impact the smaller communities. And then, of course, people are in more than one small community. And like we said before, if they feel like they're part of a different community where they're not being ostracized for doing this unusual thing, then they yes. leave that community or sometimes bring things into that community. So all of that stuff, the kind of grassroots bottom up and the top down stuff mix and match in a way that uh, I think there's going to be a significant acceleration uh, in 2024 and early 25. Do you think that you could get a runner, a professional runner in the pro field at a major marathon? Oh, at a marathon? I'm dying for this. At a marathon. It's an interesting question. The challenge, not surprisingly, is that what the big companies do is once they find someone in high school or college that looks like they've got good potential, is they start sponsoring them early. And now granted, unless you are nationally ranked, going to the Olympic trials, et cetera, you're not getting decent money typically. Yeah. Um, but the challenge with pro runners is they've been so used to the thing they're doing that as a former serious, I'm still a competitive athlete, but when I was like ser super, super serious, the idea of changing anything is terrifying. And right, yeah. and I say this to pro athletes all the time, don't switch mid-season, don't switch just because. <laughs> if you want to explore this, here's the way to do it. Start by walking, go to the gym, yeah. do the warm-ups, and then see how you feel if it makes sense. So I don't know. Now, sprinters, on the other hand, different story. So the deal with sprinters, I've been developing a new sprinting shoe. I can't even call it a spike because it doesn't have spikes. Sure. With an unusual use of carbon fiber that hasn't really been deployed yet. It's something that I thought of a number of years ago and a company unbeknownst to me basically said, we made this thing for you and we're going to be testing it very soon. What I can say, and it actually applies to some people in some other sports as well, what I can say, can I say even this? What I can say is there are many things that people put in their shoes and they're doing it for superstitious reasons because the technology makes no sense. These things, I put them in my shoes and it demonstrably changed the way I was running. Interesting. And what I've said to anyone when they're developing a new shoe or something to put in a shoe, I go, if it really worked the way you say, we'd be able to see it in force plate data. And there's no company that's ever come up with some magic new technology for footwear where they're showing the force plate data. And I said to the guys that developed this carbon fiber thing, I told them, I said that to them and they said, oh no, this thing that we're doing, you can see it in the force plate data. Last but not least on that, because I'm two degrees of separation to a bunch of Olympic sprinters, my only goal is, I have two goals. One is to get them to try the shoe and see what they think. Yeah. And, and then, of course, the second goal, of course, would be to race in it. And then the thing with that is hopefully they would win. And my next goal, so I guess there's many goals up until this last one, is to immediately get banned by the U.S. Olympic Committee. And, oh, for unfair advantage, bare feet? Correct. <laughs> and, and the reason that we would ban, be banned is actually not even for the unfair advantage. 
it would be because we would have a patent on this technology and none of the big companies could use it. And so they would then petition that it's unfair because they can't use it. This is something that happened in the, I can't remember, you know, 60s or 70s. I have to look it up. Reebok did a thing called the brush spike. So instead of having eight big metal pointy things, they had what looked like tiny little hairs, like three, <laughs> like a centimeter long. And there was like, they'd come in little bunches, 20 of them in a bunch, mm -hmm. and maybe a couple hundred of these spread out over the shoe and they got banned. And the reason that was given was because these little brush things were messing up the track. To say that was bullshit would be an insult to bullshit. Compared was, to a metal spike, a Christmas right. tree spike. Yeah. It was completely because the big companies couldn't do it because they had a patent on it. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Now that said, that what happened is two guys wearing the brush spike won a big deal race. And so the big companies were like, oh crap, we can't do that. We're going to be screwed. We got to shut them down. The number wow. one thing that happens when you threaten one of the multi-billion dollar footwear brands with something they can't do is they try to shut you down. Wow. So we are hoping it doesn't happen, but anticipating some frivolous lawsuit. And if it happens, I will be publicizing the crap out of it. So sometimes the lawsuit is just an opportunity for you to defend yourself in front of a large audience. And The big shoe companies use lawsuits as marketing because every time one of them sues the other, it's in every newspaper in the world. So, exactly. You know, so I don't like being in that uh, group of people, but if I have to play that game, I'll play that game. I don't if want it gets to. the technology to more people, I have one more question for you, for the common man. Yes. Composite steel-toed boots. It's Everyone the, I talk it's to, it's the are number any one, plans? Yeah, yeah. It's the number one request we get. We've been working on it for quite a while. Not surprisingly, the challenge is making something that has the protective and functional features that those boots have, while still allowing for as much natural movement as humanly possible. And where you run into the glitch in natural movement is basically at toe off. When you're getting to the point where the last thing on the ground is your toes, yeah. it's, it's easy to make something that at that point feels like you just go flop and you're yep. stuck. And there are technologies that we played with for eliminating that while still having the protective feature of a steel or composite toe, but there's other things that go into that as well. And to be totally candid, I don't know what that means. I know everyone, anyone who's listened to this or seen me on live events knows that I can't keep a secret to save my life. Some of the stuff we're doing with pro athletes has a bigger bang for the buck than what we do with a composite toe product. Yep. And it's easier to develop the things for them than to figure out the problems on the composite toe thing. Plus to make something that is usable uh, for construction workers, for example, mm -hmm. you need to go through an OSHA certification and even more rigid certifications in the EU that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wow. So it's tricky is the best thing I can Dead say. Dead on arrival. Dead no, on arrival. No, not, changes. You know, definitely not DOA, but we are not a company with huge bundles of money hiding in the back somewhere. We don't have some venture capital fund behind us with millions of dollars and they're willing to lose money for years till they make money. Yes. So we have decisions, this is going to sound peculiar to most people, but because we're growing so fast, we have to make certain kinds of decisions about how to spend our money on the yes. products that allow us to continue to grow so fast. And because we can, we only have so much money for inventory. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky balancing act that no one has ever gotten right. We're doing the best we can. So suffice it to say, as someone who made a live has made a living for all of his life up until doing zero shoes, by doing something, immediately getting paid, and then being done with the transaction. Yeah. This thing of planning three years out with all these mm, competing constraints makes my brain explode. So yes. you know, we're working on it. That's a that's totally reasonable, right? Like sometimes the economics just doesn't work out, and uh, the the people who you know you need to decide whether or not you're going to get the thousands of people who are benefiting from the technology that we already have, and how are we going to fund this technology that might not work out? I cannot tell you how difficult it is to even just conceptualize the composite toe. Everybody talks to me about it, and I say yeah, if you, there's this regulation there. That was put there by people who did not work at Zero Shoes. These people, 
designed it from a bench, a legislative bench, and now you have to get around it for natural movement. It's very, just the construction, I, I can't even imagine how you would do it. It's tricky. I will say this, and I'm not recommending this. There are people that I've heard from. We had a big uh, a big meeting with all the people who had said, I'm looking for a work boot. And mm -hmm. a, a number of them said things like, my last set of boots blew out. I just took the toe from that. And then I bought a pair of fill in the blank shoe that were a size and a half too big and just threw that toe in there. And that's what I'm <laughs> using when I'm on a roof, climbing a ladder, whatever it is. And I said, I, I can't be responsible for that. <laughs> Way off label use, uh, but knock yourself out. So we'll see. So I, I want to back up before we... Uh, wrap it up. Um, sure. And which again is coming back to my, th sorry, my thoughts about the whole idea of foot strike when you're walking. And mm -hmm. I want to uh, bring up as part of a way to wrap this up, perhaps that there was a guy who did a video that got a lot of attention where he was saying, here he is in some uh, like outfit from a few hundred years ago that you're supposed to, basically he was showing overstriding and plantar flexing. And that's the way mm -hmm. you're supposed to have your foot. And his rationale was you're getting the most feedback that way about what to step on or step in. And I will undeniably agree that you have the most opportunity for reflexively stepping off of something if you are landing more towards the front of your foot, but not by prancing, not by, because if you basically, you have, you still have the majority of your weight on your planted foot. While mm -hmm. your foot is coming down and subtly checking out, this is a cool space to be, you can still pull off and you don't lose your balance. My biggest regret or my two biggest regrets with zero shoes is that I didn't on day one look at what my footprint looked like when I stepped out of a hot tub or a pool, with mm -hmm. sort of like an oval with some dots in front of it. Now, mm -hmm. footprint, not one of those footprints with a massive arch in it, but it looks like a recognizable footprint. Mm -hmm. the other is I had no way of measuring the simultaneously or in conjunction, the flexibility of my foot and the speed mm -hmm. of my reflex arc of stepping off of something because it feels like, it seems I am able to flex around things that used to mm -hmm. be difficult to step on. Um, and if I step on something unpleasant, I'm stepping off of it much more quickly than I would have in the past. I have no measurement for that. I'm sure you have experiences similar or some experience in that domain because of some of the things you're stepping on or in, but like the biggest regret is I don't have the data to show what the ch those changes were. For me, most of the time, uh, what's the worst thing I've stepped on Uh rusty nail in Yellowstone national park, sticking up out of a bridge, stepped on it. Didn't realize it until two steps later, I was totally fine. <laughs> I wasn't fine for about a minute and a half of me yelping in the middle of the park when there's wildlife around. Yeah. But it was totally fine. I think that is very difficult to find something that's truly damaging to life and limb to step on in New York City. And I run over glass. I go on the bridle path. I run over sharp rocks. I think that our feet were well designed to run over some much, much worse stuff that I can't even find stuff to, to step on anymore. I step on acorns, step on all this stuff. Um, but for me, it's when I'm walking, if I step on something uncomfortable, I will definitely stutter step and essentially do a one leg hop on the other side. But that's a reflex that I think was uh, pretty well designed for me. The worst is when I heel strike and then go over a rock or something, and then it's right in there. That's real pain. But when I'm approaching it like this, my toes are mostly flexible. But it's a definitely a good question. I can tell you that most people, despite relying on walking is probably something for most people it's mostly their entire physical life is just is walking they really don't even know what to look for or think about it yeah. and so for me it's oh yeah go ahead you just said my favorite thing look for oh just lost him again we'll pause for one sec be right back <laughs> Recording. all right okay we're gonna we're gonna third time's a charm so hopefully we get enough juice to make that happen all right once again i have no memory of where we were because i don't remember anything that comes out of my mouth. four foot walking in terms of the heel touching the ground no, is no, the no, best no. What, way what, to yes it was also again just what you've noticed about if you paid attention to anything that feels like it has changed 
when with the time that you've spent that you've spent barefoot yeah yeah, yeah. so first off when i started barefoot before my first ever zero shoes uh or anything like that even back when i had ultras which has the cushion and everything so that didn't do much so even with the foot freedom there i still had the cushion that was keeping all my my feet all like this then i get zero shoes First off, I had a bunion in a bunionette from my Nike Pegasus. And so my big toe was in here. Second, I had two hammer toes. It's really funny how you can see some people's feet who look so deformed, but you'll notice they go by a very geometric pattern, especially like the Brooks people, the, the people who wear Brooks. So you can have hammer toe and all this. But then eventually it will go around and you say, wow, that literally looks like the insole of a Brooks shoe. And so all the chaos going in there is fitting in. So people say, we want to break in the shoe. You don't break in the shoe. You break in your foot. Your foot breaks in. So, so don't do that. So I had really bad feet, despite being very strong, but I had very bad feet. Over time, I would feel injury. All of a sudden, injury and my toe starts going like this. And then all of a sudden, more injury. But the thing about these injuries is that it was swelling and some metatarsalalgia and some sort of transition injury and whatnot. But then after the injury, I would have better range of motion. And all of a sudden, something would start to make sense. So my shoe size, Stephen, went from an 11 and a half to a 15. Isn't that insane? Now, yeah. I use the Genesis sandal because my – and here's, here's the other thing. So when you're supplying shoes – all of a sudden, the people go on the internet who are your biggest fans in the beginning, and then they say they're making the shoes tighter. They're not making the shoes tighter. Your feet are expanding. And then there is this one company called Softstar who makes these very wide shoes. But these are shoes that are specialty shoes for people who have been barefoot for a long time. And whenever the companies try to widen out the toe box, everyone gets mad because they're not at that stage of the journey yet. And the question is, do you want to get the people who are most at risk to um, make the biggest improvement, or do you want to cater to the people who are already probably doing okay? It's very difficult for a shoe manufacturer to decide well, that. You know, we have, when we first started, we were doing do-it-yourself sandal kits, and we would then do custom-made sandals. People would send a tracing of their foot. We'd make a sandal for them. We have about 5,000 tracings, and we saw the vast range of foot shapes, and our goal is to, you know, it's in a bell curve. There are people who have really narrow feet, people who have really wide feet, um, of varying shapes. There's basically 54 shapes of a human foot for the same size. And our goal is to make things that fit the largest percentage of that bell curve. Mm -hmm. so super, super wide feet, we're not there. People, let me rephrase that. Super, super high volume feet, because it's not about yes. two-dimensional width. It's about the three-dimensional volume of your foot and the three-dimensional volume of the shoe. Similar idea, super, super low volume feet, same thing. So we're trying to accommodate as many as we can, knowing that we can't get everybody, which pains me, certainly not with one product. And when people say, well, why don't you just make a version that's a wide version? I go, because then we would need double the warehouse space and double the inventory and we're just not there yet. So yeah. uh, that's a whole other story. The people, the thing with humans is they think that if they can imagine something, it must be doable and simple. <laughs> And neither of those. And the economics work out. out. And the economics work out. So yeah, neither of those are necessarily the case. Um, suffice it to say, the but I, I do want to put some closure on this one. Your take as someone who comes out in the um, walking should be ball of your foot first and foremost. No healthy animal walks on its heel. Okay. And what's your take on landing sort of ball of your foot and then your heel coming down and touching the ground or mm. not. don't touch interesting Heel doesn't touch the ground he'll never touch the ground i would argue that back to your point about the achilles if you don't let your heel come all the way down you're not getting the full strength and ability out of your achilles it's one centimeter or one millimeter before the ground so it looks like and the other thing is that you can still pull the achilles back here but it goes yeah. way down to the ground but never touches and when you let the Achilles down, it's the bow and arrow pulling. But if it touches, it can touch maybe skin deep, not a problem. But the second that heel comes to rest, the arrow gets let out. So my, ar my argument would be that if you are landing with your foot predominantly under your center of mass, by the time your heel is touching the ground, 
at mid stance, you're already, it's, it's basically a kind of touch and go thing because mm -hmm. one thing, if you're overstriding and then you're landing ball of your foot and your heel comes down, because then you have just more ground contact time. And again, this would all be stuff we would have to research in a whole bunch of different ways. But I would, my contention would be that little extra bit is where the, the magic is, because basically if your Achilles is able to stretch that much, and every, for almost everybody it is, then mm -hmm. it's that last little bit that initiates the stretch reflex. You don't get a stretch reflex at a normal stretch level. You get it at that extreme. And, and if that's what's happening, the amount of time that it takes for that to happen, you're probably already, I would suggest that it's part of the thing that then is getting your foot to work well to get you off the ground into that next step as you are falling and you're catching yourself for not falling on your face. Don't know. We'd have to, this would be a fun thing to look at biomechanically and unfortunately. Absolutely. There's a bunch of different interpretations of this. With the interpretation that I have, the goal is to minimize the impact shock on the ground that goes into your orthopedic chain through heel strike. Yeah. And it's to maximize the impact absorption from the Achilles tendon, which otherwise goes into the rest of your body. When your heel doesn't touch the ground, there's no impact shock into the heel. And when your heel does touch the ground, that means that there is some impact shock that goes up into the heel. The knees are the traditional shock absorber in the United States. Yeah. And that's why we have knee replacement, hip replacement, upper back, lower back, headaches, and neck pain. Well, to be clear, mm. the knees are the traditional shock absorber if you're overstriding, heel striking, and so you're basically landing with a relatively straight leg because the muscles, ligaments, and tendons around the knee are perfect shock absorbers. And there's research from Isabel Sacco in Brazil where she took elderly women. And when I say that, I realize they're not that much older than I was or than I am now. <laughs> Some of them are, many of them not so much. Anyway, these are women who had knee osteoarthritis, not just, hey, I think I have knee pain, but looking at x-rays, arthritis. Mm -hmm. She put them in a minimalist shoe and just said, walk around in these. And six months later, the worst case scenario was people who had reduced their medication dramatically because they were mm -hmm. that kind of knee pain. And for many of them, for some of them, at least, the knee osteoarthritis was gone because yeah. she says they weren't putting that continued force into the knee joint. They were using their muscles, ligaments, and tendons to protect, yeah. which is what it's designed for. Yeah. If you look at, it's the, we have 850 pounds of force absorption capacity from our Achilles tendon. We don't use it. And overstriding is a really interesting concept too, because overstriding mm -hmm. is, is like a pulling thing. Like you over, you overstride and you want to pull, yeah, pull. the ground behind yeah. you. And your foot has, your foot will get blisters uh, well, on the than, bottom of your foot to prevent that. Uh, yeah. I have a whole diagnostic thing of if you're getting blisters, depending on where you're getting them, it's going to tell you what you're doing wrong. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that when you're having to pull your foot under you, you're using your glutes and hamstrings when they're in the weakest position. Instead yeah. Of position, which leads me to something you're going to like. Um, I, I've talked about this in the last few podcasts, I think because it's something that I only have recently stumbled onto and and do. So outside of our house is a trail kind of hilly. And I have this new way of walking uphill that I think you will get a kick out of. Ready? Yeah. So, um, imagine you are standing on your right leg as you're, in, as you're walking and you basically want to do nothing with your left leg. Okay. Yep. What you do with your right leg, the thing that you're doing that's going to move you is you're twisting your upper body to the left, okay? And so what that does is it stretches your right hip flexor. And because you're, again, a little falling forward, you have a hill in front of you, if you just use your left foot to stop you from falling on your face, and as soon as it touches the ground, as you start to turn your body back towards the right, your hip flexor releases and so you had stretched it and then it releases and just like rubber band stretching it, when you release it, it springs a little forward. Yeah. So you're twisting totally to the right now with your left leg on the ground, you're stretching your right hip flexor and the right foot just comes in contact with the ground in front of you. Cause again, you're on an upward hill. Yeah. And then you reverse the whole process. So basically you're twisting your way up the hill. It takes yep. almost no leg strength and you look like a complete doofus. <laughs> I don't care. Because it's really cool. Yeah. So 
The, the hip flexor is definitely the stretch reflex is what pulls the knee forward. If you're a faster runner, then you would have what looks like a, a knee drive forward that's intentional or something. It's just the hip flexor that when you're, you're back, it'll stretch and just spin you forward. That's why people say run relaxed. Like you, you see the fastest people in the world, they're running totally relaxed. Oh, and when Tyson. you look at me, it's... People say that and I go, look at Tyson Gay, who up until Usain Bolt was the fastest man in the world. And when that guy is sprinting, it looks like he's going to explode. There's so much. Yeah, pressure, that's you know? true. So it's it's There's definitely different for the for athlete, but uh, efficient running, especially over the marathon distance. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the sprints as well, you go in the 400, you need to be. Sorry, the what? Oh, for the 400. 400 that's a marathon. Are you kidding? That's all a the, marathon what's, for you. What's that's around the in a, marathon. All the way around the track. Are you nuts? You need to definitely be relaxed because you're, it, it's incredible how the speed maintenance is, it needs to be totally like second nature and to totally relaxed like that. And then the foot will just do it. Like you look at some of the best runners who become the champions in the marathon, and even some of the best sprinters, when they're growing up, they're actually not thinking about it. Oh yeah, they're letting their their neuromuscular system as well as physics and their environment dictate their running. But when you get an American track coaches and they say, "Look forward," and they, you get American track coaches and say, "Arms must be like this, never across the midline." You look at the best, like truly natural running is a result of our anatomy and the environment. It's not really something that's built, even though, of course, drills are, are always uh, totally useful. Um, the only problem is that in the Western world, obviously, because we have these big cushion shoes, we have absolutely no experience. So the second we put on zero shoes, the second that we, we go barefoot, uh, we, for the first year, you're walking like a one-year-old. And then it takes uh, five years until you're walking like a five-year-old. <laughs> and we need we all need to do it. And it was a, a bit of a catch up period. I, I will I, I will contend based on my research back when I was at Duke that the learning period and the adaptive period is also similarly different for everybody. Although I, I would uh, say that they people fall into four different categories. It's not worth getting into right now for um, neurological categories that say something about what the transition period will look like or could look like. Sadly, there is no, I haven't figured out a self-diagnostic for people to use to identify which one of those categories they're in because depending on which one you're in, it does change what kind of feedback you need to tell your brain what's going on to inspire a new gait pattern that's outside of the one that you're habitually using. But that's a whole other conversation. That transition, that never-ending transition. It, it takes a lifetime to build strong feet. That's what I tell people. They want to, they want to go up to me and say, "How long until I'm running? Like how long? How long until I'm running super fast like this?" I say, "It takes a lifetime to build strong feet." My my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Depends on you. Look, it's another again back to what my comment about uh, Western thinking. We can think of it; it must be easy and doable. Everybody thinks they can look at some fitness expert or bodybuilder and go, I could look like that. No, you can't. Statistically, highly unlikely. They think, oh, I, I see this fast runner. I'm sure I could get there. Not likely. The people who that we the people that we see, and I'm putting myself in this equation, are genetic freaks. And I say that because I used to say for men in my age group, I may be the fastest Jew in the world. But then I met my friend Alan Tissenbaum and Tiss crushes me. But he is a, the guys who are like the fastest sprinters in my age group. I'm 61 now, so I'm in the 60, 64 age group. They are the freakiest of the freaks. Yeah. Um, and that's just the way I, I didn't learn. I, I'm again, I'm at the back of the top of the pack is the best way I can say it. But I've been like that since I was in kindergarten or in kindergarten, I was at the top of the pack. I was at the top of the pack till I turned about 15. 16. What, what do you think? There's a hundred people in your age group faster than you on earth. Oh, and then all these guys are like, I'm the worst of this. Uh, I'm they're like, darn, I'm the worst of the top hundred. It's wait, I, I someone, 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 wait, hold on. It's someone who, I heard today who was a silver medalist in the Olympics. She goes, I was the best. I was the fastest loser. So, they're never happy. No, they're never happy. I, I read something like. 30% of people over the age of 30 will ever sprint again in their life. And it's really? usually for the bus, only 30%. And you get these guys who so I show up to the track meet. Every one of these guys is unhappy with their position. 
in the track meet. But if, if you're even the worst, even if you're in last place in the track meet, you are the top 1% of, uh, of oh, physicality. Yeah. If you just show up, are you ever going to be the top 1% of the 1%? Probably not. Here's but. my line. I'm never, my goal as a sprinter, I have a couple. I want to just continue hitting all American times, which get <laughs> slower and slower every five years. And right now, last year, I was pretty close to setting the all American time for the age group behind me. And I think that I had it in me to do two age groups behind me, but then I had cancer. And and so that put a crimp on my indoor season. So that's one goal. Continue hitting all American times. Goal number two, make it into a semifinal at the Worlds. It's the best I would do. Top 16. That would be awesome. Goal number three, have some of those super fast guys invite me into a four by 100 relay and get carried around in a relay. You, would you consider going to the Penn Relays? They have master's events now and you're hundred percent fast. Yeah, enough. But, it, it, but it's invitation only for the masters. Why aren't they inviting you? I'm not that guy. Seriously, for your question about in the world, the last time I checked world rankings for indoor, I was somewhere around number, I was somewhere around 70th. And, but again, that's, that doesn't mean that there aren't guys who are faster who pushed me back that hadn't competed that year or whatever it is. For Penn, realize it's an invite. And the invitation typically goes to those really well-known guys who are the ones who crush me. It would be fun. I would love to do that race. That would be a blast, but I'm, they're not going to invite me. My goal in, tr in track and field is to continue in the sport until I'm old enough that I get that invite into the Penn Relays. The Zach. old man race, the 100 year up, I've been training my whole life for it. And you just need to eat well, don't do anything silly. This is what happens when you go to the, to the Masters World Championships. So when I went in Finland 15 years, uh, 14 years ago, uh, there was a 101 year old guy who did the field events. So he did the shot put and he did the javelin, I think. Maybe wow. Just, I don't remember. Either way, comes out in his walker, super slow, gets to the line, puts down his walker. They hand him whatever the implement is for the <laughs> shot. I think it's two pounds at that point. I don't know. It doesn't matter. He goes, ah, it goes like five, 10 feet and the crowd goes insane. <laughs> and their first thought is I want to be that guy. And their second thought is I just need to outlive all the people sitting next to me. That's the key. You just need to outlive everyone out here and then still show up. Because here's the thing, you can't just be 101 and not show up. No, here's the annoying news for me. I was just turned down for a Guinness Book World Record. An oldest standing backflip. And the reason they turned me down, I can still do one. And the reason they turned me down is there's a 94 and some number of days guy who did one into a pool. I, I can't find a video about it. That doesn't count. I'm doing it on the ground. And all I yeah. know... Is my Olympian friends, when they see that, or my friends who are like really good, there's a guy, Juji Mufu is a friend and Juji is a great flipper. And when I showed him what I did, his response, because I'm like almost, ah, no, he's in his thirties. Maybe he's getting close to 40, but his response was still, are you fucking kidding me, dude? <laughs> so, it's incredible, right? I don't know. It's what I do. He's so, huge. Oh yeah. Oh no, he's great. Yeah. He's the fact yeah. that he can do standing backflip is really awesome. So, um, so I was really bummed that they would not, allow me to create a new category of oldest standing backflip on a, on the ground. They said level surface is all we care about. I went, but he didn't even land it. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That doesn't I count. I think if everyone listening petitions, the Guinness world record group to say should be on the ground, landing it on your feet. Two categories. He still gets to keep his, but yeah. you got to have the one on yeah. the ground. A hundred percent. Exactly. I agree. So hopefully we'll get a little petition drive going. I'm literally, you know what? I never, I was saying that as a joke, but I think I'm going to get a petition going. Oh so, yeah. So that one is, and, and the joke there is I'm 61. If I, if they had allowed me to do it, there's no question in my mind, there'd be some guy, some circus freak who's a couple of years older than me who would be able to then beat me. And then we would just have a duel until one of us dies. <laughs> that would be some fun. old Moscow circus yeah. guy. Oh, it would be hysterically fun. Yeah, that would be hysterically fun. Obviously, you don't want to get too many people who are untrained. You need the gymnastics background for your whole yeah. life. I'm not going to be entering this at any time yeah. in my life. But no, you, I've been you, curious to try gymnastics, but there's nothing I can do. I'm just, there's thing. nothing I can even start doing. It's just impossible. Yeah. I tried the rings. I get up there, dropped. <laughs> too much for me. For the backflip thing, the only way, the only people who would ever be able to engage in that that competition are people who, like me, prior to the age of about 25, had done probably 
and I'm not exaggerating, 30,000 standing backflips. Yeah, especially as a diver. No, it was not that. It was because as a street performer, and when I was performing at Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Virginia, I was doing anywhere between 10 and 50 a day. So that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. That's athleticism, like beyond. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's again, genetic freakish, freakishness. And just for the fun of saying it, like when I used to do a lot of them and I, and I, now I do them very infrequently when I was doing a lot well into my forties, maybe into my early fifties, but definitely into my forties, I, I could literally see the entire thing. I could feel the entire thing. The last few that I did when I did one at 61, when I did one, when I did one at 60, when I did one at 55 or something, I set it and I can see that. And then I literally black out until I've flipped and I'm seeing my feet coming towards the ground and I figure out where to put my feet. It's the weirdest thing in the world. It's just so much muscle memory that I can do it basically unconscious. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. It's very interesting. That's incredible. I was impressed when you could do the old man test with the socks. Uh, I saw that one. I was like, wow, that's so impressive. Let me send that to some people. Next, I should send them that you, you're doing the still just like the tumble. The backflip, oh the my backflip goodness. On, yeah, that's on TikTok and things as well. The old man and test. it's so funny because like the age thing, if you go to anybody who's just a normal person who's 19 years old and ask them to do any of this, it's not happening. I can tell you, I have mixed feelings about the fact that when I'm at a track meet and there's a bunch of master's people who are in their 30s to 40s, and even the ones in their 40s, let alone the high school kids that might show up, and they tell me that I'm an inspiration, it's everything I can do not to punch them. <laughs> I don't feel old enough to be an inspiration yet. You are an inspiration. I hope I don't get <laughs> punched. But it's it's as a person. It's not uh, regardless of yeah, age, just being able stop. to to get on there, it's it really is inspiring. And the, the other thing is, it's so inspiring, but it's also so informative because there's actionable stuff that you do that nobody else does. And it, it's there's some people who are like, I'm really inspired to get out there. But for you, it's I'm really inspired to start doing what this guy's doing because it has results. And there's a whole, it's not even just you because that inspiration is now like a hundred thousand people. I don't know how many customers this is, but it's, it's oh, thousands of people. It's creating a revolution and there's a huge it's following. It's approaching, and, it's approaching 2 million. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. 2 million people. Yeah. It's 2 million people and it's just incredible. I'm one of them, obviously, and it's changed my life. If you think of the number of years, I'm going off and I'm doing the same thing. But if you look at the number of years of pain, of orthopedic pain uh, not had, yeah. that's the most important metric you can have because it's it's uh, it's, it's truly inspirational. That's, that's all I can say. I hope I hope I don't get punched in the face of that. No, no, but no, no, that's like, it. It's, it's simply because here, here's what I can say. I have a genetic disorder. My genetic disorder is I think of anybody as a friend of mine. If there's at any point they start doing any of this sort of bowing down, you're an inspiration thing, <laughs> it gets in the way of that, hey, you're just a friend of mine thing. So I have to do something to shake that out of them uh, because it gets in the way of having a relationship with a peer. And that's that's where it is. I, I, I have no interest in being on any sort of pedestal other than the one with a gold medal because we just won the four by four real or the four by one relay. And even then, it's still any given Sunday, the guys in second or third could have won. I'm very wow. You know. I, I go to the I go to the Masters track meets. I cannot believe these people. I, I just can't believe them. They're unbelievable. There's this one woman, Sue McDonald. Sue McDonald. No. She just turned 60 a couple months ago, already has every world record. In, in, in the sprints and she it's, it's incredible it's discipline and it's it's incredible but it's, it's the showing up that's like the I, for, to me that's the most important part and showing up after you have a bad meet where you embarrass yourself out of everyone in front of everyone that's the the hardest part because oh dude when i went to the fit the world championships in finland i had the worst race of my life and it, it was undeniably embarrassing and i'm looking forward to getting back and having people go oh wow cool you actually worked it and got better 
So it was just a horrible race for me. But I also had no experience at that time. So I, I don't, you know, kick, kick myself too much. Um, oh my gosh. Obviously, it's no one even asked how you did. They just go, oh, you went to a track meet? That's so cool. There is that. And track meets are just attention deficit sort of theater. So anyway, uh, we could go off on that forever, but let's not do that. Barry, for anybody who wants to find out what you're doing in New York, if they're in New York and they want to track you down and have some experience of what you've been doing and helping them do the same, how can they find you? www.footcamp.net. I have my whole schedule of classes. I have a whole store where you can buy all your toe spacers, rock mats, and your barefoot shoes and all that stuff. And uh, I have a blog where I go over technique guide. I go over what you can expect by going barefoot. I can go over how to, what, what you can expect with a barefoot lifestyle. And you can follow me on social media under Barry Wine is my Instagram handle and on Facebook as well. We'll put all those in the show notes. And I'm on ClassPass. Free classes on ClassPass. There you go. Obviously, this has been a total blast. <laughs> and so thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I can't believe, frankly, that it just took this time, this much time till we cross paths in a way to make this happen. So I'm really thrilled and grateful and really appreciate it. Can't wait to hear how all these things continue to evolve because like I said, it's all of us who are spreading the word. And at a certain point, we'll hit a critical mass where even the doubters are going to go, hey, let me give it a shot. And exactly. that's the world's going to change. So until then, for everybody else, first of all, thank you for being here. Secondly, if anyone notices, yes, I'm getting over a cold, hence my voice. Third, don't forget to go to www.jointhemovementmovement.com for previous episodes, all the ways you can find us in social media, the place you can find the podcast if you're not happy with one where you've already found it. And if you have any questions or comments or feedback, if there's anyone you think I should be having on the show, or especially if you know someone who thinks I have a case of cranial rectal reorientation syndrome, <laughs> in my way. That would be a really entertaining conversation. You can drop me an email, move, M-O-V-E, at jointhemovementmovement.com. And until then, most importantly, go out, have fun, and live life feet first. <laughs>